Hey guys, it's Shadowflyer. So, earlier today I was flying, but completely forgot to set up my camera to record everything. Only like one or two of the planes have GoPro mounts in them, and when I finally got him one, I was so focused on flying that I forgot to record. So, to make up for my lack of recent recording, I decided to ride in the back during one of my friend's flights and record him doing some stuff. I'm not going to go into the itty bitty details for each of the maneuvers in this video, but I do want to take some time to explain some of the big differences between flying in small single engine planes and flying some small twins. This plane is a fairly new Piper Seminole with an integrated Garmin G1000. Just like our Skyhawks, it has one large PFD and one large MFD. This is the only multi-engine plane I've flown so far but I have flown several different types of single engine planes before, so I'll go off that experience to compare the two. I've got the audio in the front disconnected from this recorder, so we won't hear them, but they also don't have to listen to me, which is great. All right, so startup to flying is all pretty similar. There's a few extra things to check on the pre-flight checklist, but it's really not too much different than checking low wing planes. The starting checklist is the same for pretty much any carbureted engines, but now there's two engines to start, so it does take technically twice as long. Uh, taxiing checklist is the same for both VFR and IFR um, in single engine planes. Uh, the first main difference is during the run-up. The differences here are due to the engines being constant speed or variable pitch props. I've only flown one single engine plane with this type of propeller, so it's different than most planes I've ever flown before. But if your plane isn't fixed pitch and it's already like this, then for you it wouldn't really be any different. Um, the only main difference is that instead of just having a throttle lever and a mixture lever for the engines, now you have a third one. Uh, it's usually in the middle of the two and it's usually blue, but that can change. In this one it's exactly that. But it controls the propeller pitch and RPM. So if you bring it back towards you, then the RPM of the propellers go down and the pitch of the propeller blades, it tries to take a bigger bite. Um, if you want more details on that, feel free to Google it or you can ask and I can go into more detail, but for this video, that's, that's about all you need to know. So during the run-up check, you will need to check that the propellers will feather. Um, then you'll check the correct readings for manifold pressure, RPM, and oil pressure um, when you adjust the propeller lever. After that, you'll verify that the alternators can pick up the extra load if the other one fails, and everything else is pretty much the same. Alright, we're about to take off. Audio Again, off. very similar to other planes, but put in full power, verify the engine indications on the green, and keep the plane on center line for takeoff. In this plane, we'll rotate it 75 knots, then we'll crab as necessary to correct for the wind, and then we'll climb out at 88 knots. Once there's any efficient runway remaining to land on, we'll bring up the gear and begin the after takeoff checklist. We'll keep climbing until we get to our desired altitude, then we'll do our cruise checklist. Again, a lot of this is the same as in a single engine airplane. One nice thing about this plane is that because it has counter-rotating props, it has almost no P-factor or turning tendencies, so very little rudder is needed to keep it coordinated. Uh, if you don't have counter-rotating props, then you would probably still have a lot of those issues, but in this case we do, so don't have to worry about it, which is really nice. So one huge difference between flight training in a multi-engine plane to flight training in a single-engine plane is what you're training for. So in a single engine plane, especially when you're going in to your commercial training for it, you have a lot of maneuvers you have to like remember how to do, and you have to get them down like to perfection, pretty much. Um, they have a little bit of leeway, but if you're barely getting that leeway before the check ride, then by the time you get there with all your nervousness, you're gonna end up messing up, and you don't want that to happen. So you pretty much need to get down perfect before you go into your check ride. However, multi-engine flight training is a lot different. There's not nearly as many maneuvers to do. You do power off stalls, you do power on stalls, you do accelerated stalls, 
Uh, you'll do slope light, steep turns, and then you do a VMC demo. Uh, if you're not in multi-engine, you may not know what VMC is. Uh, the short and sweet version is VMC is the speed at which directional or lateral control of the aircraft can no longer be maintained after failure of one or more engines. So in this case, we only have one engine. If you lose both, VMC doesn't matter because you're effectively a glider. But if you were flying like a three or four engine airplane, then yeah, you could lose more than one and still have at least one engine running. But in this case, twin, got two engines. Uh, what we'll do is we'll fail one engine, not literally, but we'll just take the mixture out. Uh, we will let that uh, propeller stop turning. We'll feather the engine, uh, and then you're literally doing flight with one engine. Uh, we're going to actually do that pretty soon, and I'll make sure to get that on video. Yeah, a lot of the training in a multi-engine plane is either very basic training, like the slow flight, steep turns, uh, power off, power on stalls, stuff you did in private, so it's pretty easy stuff. The, the only other difference is that you have to learn a lot of stuff with single engine. So you will literally do single engine work in the pattern. You'll do it in the cruise. You'll do it on landing. Um, it's not honestly that difficult. The biggest thing with that would just be learning the checklist for having an engine out and getting it down, getting it memorized, and getting it done fast. If you have two propellers and one of them's windmilling, meaning it's the engine's not turning it, but it's catching wind and the wind is turning it, it's producing a ton of drag. And you will feel that in the rudder pedals because you'll have to press in the opposite rudder pedal to keep the airplane going straight. And it's legitimately a good leg workout. I go to the gym pretty often. It's, it's hard to hold after a while. So you'll want to make sure that you have that checklist down, memorized. Um, it's different probably a little bit for each plane, but the main important thing is that we call out is blue line ball bank fix, mix prop throttle, flaps up, gear up, dead foot, dead engine, identify, verify, and we go through engine securing procedures. Uh, and you want to get that done within like seconds. It, you don't necessarily have to say it all out loud, but it really does help because it's very easy to forget things. So I tend to forget the throttle part. You think it's super common, it's like common in the sense that you do it all the time, you wouldn't have to think about putting in the throttle of the operating engine, but uh, for some reason, I put in full mixture, full props, and I say full throttle, and I don't even touch it. I don't know why, but as long as you get that down really fast, uh, it goes a lot smoother once you get that propeller feathered and it's no longer turning. Uh, you'll also play with the cow flaps and stuff just to kind of reduce drag on that side. And at that point, it's usually a lot easier to control. Uh, it's a little bit slower because you only have one engine. Um, but overall, it's, it's not nearly as bad as when that propeller's still windmilling. All right, so this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're about to shut off this engine. Technically, the engine shut off right now. Uh, this is what I was talking about with the windmilling. When, it, when the propeller is not feathered uh, and you're flying, it's going to continue spinning even though the engine's not on. So uh, just looking outside, it's hard to differentiate which engine is on. You have to do it based off certain engine gauges and primarily based off your rudder. So if you want to keep the airplane straight, you're going to have to put in a lot of rudder and you'll, you'll use the uh, phrase dead foot, dead engine, meaning whatever foot's not doing work and pushing in the rudder, that's the side of the dead engine. Looking outside, the uh, propeller is windmilling. Uh, right now, he is pulling back the uh, blue lever that we talked about earlier, and we're going to get that engine feathered. Uh, you'll see it start slowing down. There we go. It is feathered, so it's no longer spinning. That significantly reduces the drag, so the rudder input required to maintain uh, straight flight at this point is a lot easier to uh, hold and maintain than when that propeller is rotating. In a little bit, I'll show you what, how we uh, get it uh, started up again. And we're back. He is currently pushing in that uh, blue lever to 
unfeather the prop. So we have a propeller uh, uh, feather accumulator, I believe is what it's called. Uh, it pretty much just saves some of the pressure so that if you want to unfeather your engine in flight, you could do so. A lot of bigger airplanes, they don't have this because there's no need for it. They, they don't want you feathering the propeller uh, unless you actually have a dead engine. So you don't have a need to unfeather it because if the engine is actually dead, you're not going to want to have that propeller windmilling. Uh, so uh, some of the bigger planes don't have this, but our plane is a training aircraft, so we have it so that we can practice it and practice putting it back in. So as you can see, propeller spinning again. Uh, it takes takes a little bit for it to for the wind to catch it, uh, but it, the the manual even says that the wind doesn't get it spinning again uh, within I think it's like 10 seconds uh, of you putting in uh, prop mass, then just tap the uh, starter, uh, engine starter, and literally just a slight tap will get the engine spinning. That spinning will uh, be enough to catch more wind, and it'll, it'll do its own. Um, it's pretty cool. But that's most of the training in the multi-engine, is just learning how to fly it if one engine goes out and still be safe. The nice thing is that with mul multiple engines, if one goes out, you still have power to continue flying, go to an airport, and land wherever you deem necessary. It's not a, oh, I lost an engine, now I need to go crash in a field. No. You can, unless you're in like the mountain areas or somewhere where the uh, absolute or service ceiling of the plane with one engine is lower than the actual like elevation, uh, that shouldn't be an issue, and you can still fly with one engine. You do lose a ton of your power. Um, you can lose up to 80% of the power you would have to, with two engines, so it's not a matter of, oh, I lost one engine, I lost 50% of the power. No, you can actually lose up to 80%, uh, so it's a lot more significant. Uh, your plane will perform worse with one engine in inoperative than it would have if it was just built as a single engine plane because you have so much drag on that side. But other than that, that's most of the training. It, I personally don't find it too difficult, but I should probably keep that to myself until I actually pass my check ride. Um, but yeah, it's not. you don't have to do lazy eights, you don't have to do um, a whole bunch of the maneuvers you do for the single engine uh, commercial check ride. So in that aspect, there's a less to learn, but it is there is a lot more to do in a multi-engine plane. Um, so one big thing that I think is one of the hardest things about flying this plane is not the working with it with one engine out, it's actually the speed. So when you're flying a single engine plane, especially when you're doing a small training aircraft, uh, so whether it's a Piper Cherokee, Beechcraft Sundowner, um, Cessna Skyhawk, those are so just a few of the ones I've flown before, they all are really slow. They can fly really slow if necessary, and they can fly quote unquote fast if necessary, but that fast is like 120 knots if you're lucky. Uh, like that's like almost as fast as it goes usually. I think I, I, I've flown a few single engine planes that had more horsepower and they, like the one that uh, had a constant speed propeller, that one flew a lot faster. But like all, most of the basic trainers fly between like 60 knots and like 100, 110 knots uh, for crews. Uh, they, they don't go very fast. So you have plenty of time if you're at an airport You've got lots of time in the pattern to think about what you're doing next and go through checklists. Uh, you have a lot more time if you're coming to land and you need to get things done or you need to slow down or you need to do whatever. you got time. Uh, in a multi-engine plane, the ones we're flying now, we, like on an instrument approach, we come in at 100 knots, which is about the cruising speed of uh, most of the other planes I've flown. So it's a lot faster. Uh, if it's VFR, uh, those approaches will fly in at 85 knots, so a little bit slower, but still faster than the approach speed that we did for most of the single engine stuff. When you're cruising, we cruise, uh, I think we generally cruise around our 160 knots, 
um, like it's it's significantly faster, uh, especially on the climb and performance aspect. If you have both engines running, it runs a ton better than single engine planes. So it's really nice uh, when you're trying to get somewhere and you're trying to actually fly a plane for like the realistic aspect of why you'd want to fly a plane. But for training, it's a lot harder because it's so much faster. You have less time to go through checklists. You have less time to get things done that you need done and think about things before you get there. So you have to come into the airplane already knowing stuff. You have to have things memorized and you have to be able to go through the flow procedures really fast because if you don't and you're having to constantly look down at your checklist and find out what you're supposed to be doing next, you're going to be there before you know it and you're not going to have the things done you need to. Um, and if you have passengers in the future, they're not going to want you saying, oh, we need to actually go in a holding pattern because I haven't done my checklist. No, no one's going to want that. And when you're in training, you're not going to want to have to pay for that. So that's, in my opinion, that's the hardest part about training in the multi-engine plane is just because it's so much faster, you have to get things done faster. Other than that, I don't find it too difficult. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, we're about to land. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, like it, subscribe, and hopefully I'll come out with more videos. Like I said, it's kind of hard to uh, do all this with uh, the planes we're flying now. We only have a few of these uh, Piper Seminoles, and only I think one, maybe two of them have the GoPro mounts. And I don't want to have to go buy a whole bunch of mounts just to put in all the other airplanes. So. I'll record when I can. If I can't do it when I'm flying, I'll do something like today, and I'll just hop at the back while a friend of mine's flying. I'll record him, and I'll just talk from the back and get you guys something, because I don't, I don't want to leave you high and dry. Uh, I, I tend to be a little busy during college, but like I need to get stuff out to you, so I'm going to start trying to do that as best as I can, especially as it gets warmer. So look forward to more videos. Uh, again, like, subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day, guys.